This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Okay, let's go on with number six. Whoops. Six. Uh, here's a very short one. So one of those which uh, I really do think you either know the answer, ticket, or you don't know the answer, in which case, guess. Uh, under which sampling method does every member of the target population uh, has, it should be half, but anyway, an equal chance of being in the sample? Well, I can't give a full lecture on sampling here. You know, you should have been through the, uh, uh, watched all the lectures together with the lecture notes. If not, you really must. But the only sampling uh, method where every member has an equal chance of being in the sample is random sampling B. Uh, the other three are ways that, from a practical point of view, we may make the sampling perhaps easier or uh, quicker. But the only method where they've all got an equal chance is pure random sampling. Uh, seven, here's some numbers. What's the budgeted raw material purchases for the next period in kilos? Uh, we manufacture and sell one product which requires eight kilos of raw material. The budgeting data for each period is as follows. So they told us how many units we'll sell and what the opening and closing inventories are. Uh, that, in a minute, so we'll be able to work out how many units we actually need to produce. But when we know how much we're going to produce and therefore how much material we need, well, we've got opening and closing inventory of materials, we need to know what we need to buy. Well, remember, let's look at units first of all. Uh, remember, the sales, the number we sell will be the opening inventory plus whatever we produce, that would give us the total available for sale, less the closing inventory, whatever's left, those that aren't sold. So it's very much a working backwards here. We started with opening inventory, we started with 4,000 units. We produce more, we're going to calculate how many we produce. And we add that on, that would uh, tell us how many we were had available for sale. But here they weren't all, all sold. There was closing inventory of 3,000. And of course, how many did we sell? We sold 19,000. So sure, your workings any way you like. I said before, nobody's going to look at your workings. But uh, if we sold 19,000 and there was still 3,000 left, then working backwards we must have had 22,000 available to sell. And where did they come from? We'd already got 4,000 at the beginning. We must have made another 18,000. So there's how many units we actually produce. So, how much materials did we use? In order to produce 18,000 units, each unit takes, what is it, 8 kilos. Uh, and so, uh, we'd have actually used 144,000 kilos. However, finally, we need to know how many we're going to buy at the raw material purchases. Well, again, effectively working backwards, as I did a minute ago but this time on the uh, kilos. I'll write it down differently. Doesn't matter how you do your workings. But you see, for the actual production, we'll need 144,000 kilos. But if you look at the inventories, over the period, there's an increase in inventory. Uh, if we ended up with 53, oops, we started with 50. And so we need 144,000 for the production we calculated. We'll need another 3,000 kilos to increase the inventory. In total, therefore, the purchases 
147,000 kilos? The answer is B. All right, uh, next one, number eight. Which of the following graphs depicts the total cost of raw materials for a period? You've got four graphs there. Uh, I'm seeing all of them. I'm not going to draw four on the screen. Uh, but it's got dollars up the side. It hasn't said what it is along the bottom. Um, I can guess, but let's read the question, then it will be uh, hopefully clear. Up to a given level of activity in each period, the purchase price per unit of a raw material is constant. After that point, a lower price per unit applies, both to further units purchased and also retrospectively to all units already purchased. Well, forget that last paragraph for a moment. Up to a given level of activity, the purchase price per unit of raw materials is constant. Well, you should have seen similar graphs uh, before. I think it should be fairly obvious that uh, we, all those graphs, whichever turns out to be the right one, Effectively, the graph is showing the total cost uh, for the total units. Here we're talking about uh, the purchase price of a unit of raw materials. So, I don't know, if you pay $5 a unit, one unit you pay $5, two units $10 and so on, you'd expect a graph looking something like that. It's a variable cost. When there are no units, you'd expect zero cost. As you make more units, the total cost goes up. So that's certainly how it's going to start. It must go through zero, because the material cost per unit is a direct cost. No units, no cost. So the answer straight off cannot be, oh, sorry, wrong one, cannot be B. However, where the tricky bit is, where you need to uh, read carefully, it says up to a given level of activity, so I don't know, maybe up to a thousand units or something, it's going like that, more units, more cost. However, after that point, a lower price per unit applies, both to further units purchased and also retrospectively, also to all units already purchased. Now, it's very tempting to have gone for C. Now, C would have been right about from one big thing. You see, the point is, I'm making up figures here, maybe the price per unit was $10. More units, more $10. Fair enough, over a certain level, maybe the price drops down to $8. And not what I'd normally expect will be okay. So much, up to a thousand units or something. But then it carries on going up, but at a lower rate. Well, what makes it very odd here, once you get above the limit, it says the lower price per unit applies both to further units and also to all units already purchased. So you see, if the price had always been, was always $10 a unit, perhaps you get a line like that. Had it always been, let's say, a lower price, $8 a unit, it would have been something like that instead. What's happening here? Up to my limit, it's $10 a unit. Once we go above the limit, it suddenly, the total cost suddenly drops and all the units, new ones and old ones, we pay eight. So that's what it looks like. Um, the danger, of course, we knew it's not B, but is it A or D, which both look very similar? Well, the trick, that's not quite the right word, 
is that had it always been ten dollars you start at zero and go up had it always been eight dollars we'd start at zero and go up so both lines must effectively go through zero a definitely doesn't d looks to me as though it does the answer is d Number nine. Which of the following are benefits of budgeting? Uh, we've got four to choose from. And um, look at the choices. It's any two of them. Which should actually help as we're reading through. Which of the following the benefits? Uh, number one, it helps coordinate the activities of different departments. Yes, very standard. Again, I've said look at the notes and the lectures that go with them. Uh, but one of the benefits, one of the purposes often of preparing budgets, is you want to make sure, for example, that if the sales department think they can sell 10,000 units, the production department to be producing 10,000 units. There's no point in them uh, having a budget to produce 20,000. They've got to coordinate. So number one, it helps us coordinate, make sure everything fits together. Two, this one should be very obvious. It fulfills legal reporting obligations. No, there is no legal requirement to produce budgets. Uh, number three, it establishes a system of control. Uh, yes. Variance analysis, which you should have studied, is surely comparing what actually happens to what we budgeted would happen to see whether we spent too much or too little. It helps us control. Uh, once I've got those two, of course, we know what the answer is. The answer has to be B. You know, it's only any two of them. Uh, number four, though, it's starting point for strategic planning. No, strategic planning is long-term decision-making. And you'll do that first. You'll make your long-term decisions. What products are we producing and so on? And when you've done that, then you would do your budgets, which are always much shorter term. So the answer is one and three. The answer is B. And it's only when you get to questions like that where there are only... Well, here it's any two of them. Um, it's usually very helpful, you know, even if the first one, here there shouldn't have been a problem, but if number one, if you weren't actually sure what it meant or you used some words that confused you, have a look at the others, because if you can get any three of them, uh, you're certain to be able to get the right answer. If you can get two of them and it's the right two, then again, only two of them. All right, number 10, yet another one that is, um, I said earlier, I call this type written when there's no numbers. The following statements relate to the participation of junior management in setting budgets. And the basic two approaches, we either get the junior managers involved, they produce their own budgets, and I, if I'm in charge, my job is to check them and put them all together. Alternatively, uh, what some businesses do, I'm in charge, I prepare the budgets and then I tell the junior managers what they're doing. Well here, the following statements relate to the participation of junior management. Number one, it speeds up the, budget, the setting of budgets? No. No. It takes longer if I've got all the managers doing budgets and then I'm checking everything. It'd be much quicker. Oh, so it certainly sounds to be quicker if I do all the budgets myself. It's not number one. So if you're guessing, the answer has to be B or C. How about lesson number two? It increases the motivation of junior managers. Yes, very standardly. If junior managers are involved in setting the budgets, uh, they stand to be more motivated uh, to achieve what's in the budgets. 
Uh, finally, though, because I still can't pick one without knowing three. You know, the answer is still B or C at the moment. So three, it reduces the level of budget padding. No. Uh, budget pad padding, what it is, it's where a manager is doing the budgets. They perhaps think, oh, we need to spend 10,000. But because they know they'll be in trouble if they spend too much, why don't they say, ah, let's say in our budget that we actually need 12,000. I know I should be able to get away with a lot less than 12,000. It makes it much more likely I can beat budget. That's budget padding. Well, if junior managers are preparing their own budgets, there's always the danger that they budget too high an expense. Um, I check them, but I might miss it. So um, it certainly doesn't reduce budget padding, it's the other way around. So the answer is two only, the answer is B. Okay, number 11. Um, what is the company's return on investment? A company has capital employed of 200,000. It's got a cost of capital of 12% per year. Its residual income is 36,000. Well here, it's a combination obviously of having learnt the rules. What do we mean by return on investment? What do we mean by residual income? Uh, and then it's just being careful with the figures. We're told what the residual income is. And remember residual income, we take the profit from the profit statements less this interest that we charge, it gives us the residual income. What are we told? Well, we're not told what the profit was, but I do know what the interest is going to be. The cost of capital is 12%. The interest, we apply the cost of capital to the capital that's employed of 200,000. And so the interest that would be subtracted is 24,000. And they've told us what the residual income is. The residual income is 36,000. So I can work out what the profit is. If profit minus 24 is 36, the profit must be 36 plus 24. The profit is 60,000. And why do I need uh, the profit figure? It's because the question wants to know the return on investment. And I said earlier, you've got to have learned the rules, in which case you'll be happy that return on investment is the profit as a percentage uh, of the capital invested. Well, now it's easy. We've worked out the profit is 60,000. From the question, the capital employed is 200,000. I think I can do that without my calculator. Yeah, it comes to 30%. The answer is A. So I think that was a nice one. Next one. Yet another of these writing ones. There always will be quite a lot in section A. Anyway, what does it say? Which of the following could have caused the variance? Let's look back. A company has calculated a $10,000 adverse direct material variance by subtracting its flexed budget direct material cost from its actual direct material cost. So we've taken, we're not, there's no numbers here, but just so I don't get lost, the actual material cost, we subtracted its flexed budget cost and we ended up with an adverse variance. So it must have meant that we spent more on material than we should have spent. 
spent too much on material. Now, obviously, you're not going to write all this down in the exam. I said a couple of times, nobody looks at your workings. However, what could have caused that? Why would you have spent too much? Number one, an increase in direct material prices. Yes, if prices go up, that could be why we spent too much. Note it's only two of these. Number two, an increase in raw material usage per unit. Yes, if we use too much mater uh, raw material in every unit, then again, that's likely to have meant we spent too much. Units produced being greater than budget? No. Irrelevant. We flexed the budget. Uh, when you flex the budget, the flex cost, that's what we should have spent on what we actually produced. I don't care whether that was more or less than the original budget. Uh, number four. Units so being greater than budgeted. Well, for similar reasons, no, completely irrelevant. We're looking at the cost of the units we actually made. So the answer is one and two only. The answer is C. And although I read through all four, remember, very often you don't need to waste time reading all of them. It's only two. And here, once you were happy, it was the first two. Um, well, the last two. Why waste time? Number 13. A company has recorded the following variances for a period. Um, and, uh, sorry, I said read the bold bit first. I didn't. What was the fixed budget profit for the period? So what was the, they want to know what the original fixed budget profit was. They've told us what the variances were. And they've told us the standard profit for the actual sales. Be careful here. The standard profit for the actual sales 120,000. What that is, that's how much profit we should have made for our actual sales if everything had gone perfectly. So sales price variance is irrelevant. Clearly the actual profit could be different uh, because we sold at a higher or lower price. But this is the 120 is the standard profit on the actual sales. Uh, similarly, the actual profit will be different because the, uh, there's a cost variance. But again, irrelevant, that 120 isn't our actual profit, it's the standard profit for the actual sales. That's the profit we should have made, assuming the correct selling price and assuming the correct costs. So the only reason that's different from the original fixed um, budget profit is because we sold more or less than we expected. And so it's only the sales volume variance that's relevant, which is 10,000. It was adverse, so make sure you adjust this the right way around. If it's an adverse variance, it means we must have sold less than we budgeted. It must have meant the original fixed budget profit was higher. The original fixed budget would have shown a profit of 130,000. The sales volume variance 10,000 adverse meant the standard profit on our sales was lower at 120. So the answer is D. Number 14, which of the following are said to do measures of performance at the strategic level? The strategic level, this is top level of management, where you're looking at the long term situation. How can we improve things in the long term? Which are suitable measures? Well, number one, yes, return on investment. 
top level managers will be concerned about that. They'll want to improve it year on year. Two, market share, yes. If we're going to improve our position in the long term, top level managers will be concerned about market share. Number three, customer complaints, no. We will be interested in customer complaints, certainly. But that's at a lower level, that's on a more day by day management that will be concerned with customer complaints. The answer is A. Number 15. Uh, here, there really is no excuse at all. And I've said twice, if not three times, jump over questions if they're too long or taking too long or too long to read. But 15, if you've done your studying, uh, then this uh, should be so automatic, it's not true. Which of the following are feasible values for the co correlation coefficient? Well, remember, you must have learnt the coefficient of correlation. It must be between minus 1, <laughs> minus 1, and plus 1. It has to be. Number 1. Is 1.4 feasible? No. It can't possibly be plus 1.40. It can never be higher than plus 1. Number 2. Is plus 1.04 feasible? No. Again, it can't ever be higher than plus 1. Is 0 feasible? Yes. No correlation at all, but it's between minus and plus 1. And is minus 0.94 feasible? Yes. It can be positive or negative, as long as it's not beyond 1. So 3 and 4, the answer is B. Uh, C, uh, 16, sorry, 16. A company's operating costs... I'll, I've done it again. I should read the bold first, but, so let me carry on. Company operating costs are 60% variable and 40% fixed. Which of the following variances values would change if the company switched from standard marginal costing to standard absorption costing? Well, again, this should be an automatic one. If you've been through variance analysis properly, you'll know that the only variances that change between uh, marginal and absorption, the vectors are all exactly the same except the sales volume variance. If it's marginal costing, it's based on contribution. If it's absorption costing, it's based on profit. Uh, uh, on profit. And the other one is the fixed overhead volume variance. If it's marginal costing, that doesn't exist. It's irrelevant. If there's absorption costing, it does exist. Fixed overhead volume variance. And so just let's read down. Which of the following would change? Well, it's not A. All the variances, apart from what I've just listed, stay the same. So it's not A, material efficiency. It's not B, overhead efficiency. It's not D, expend fixed overhead expenditure variance. The fixed overhead expenditure variance is the same in both cases. No, it's C, the sales volume variance. OK, well, number 17... Um, ABC has manufacturing capacity of um, uh, 10,000 units. The fixed production, uh, the flex rather, production cost budget of the company is as follows. 60% capacity, costs are 11 to 80, 100% capacity, 515, 120. We're asked for the total cost if we operate at 85% capacity. Well, is it not a high-low exercise? That here, the units, if we operate at 100% capacity, they're making 10,000 units, and the total cost is 15,120. On the other hand, at 60% capacity, which is making 6,000 units, the cost is lower at 11,280. And so the high-low 
the cost involved, there must be an element of fixed cost and variable cost. Well, high-low, you should find very quick indeed. The difference between the two, the extra cost of 0, 4, 1, 3, 8, I think 3, 8, 40. Sorry, I should have used my calculation in the first place. 5120 minus 11280. Yeah, the extra 3840 must be the extra variable cost of the extra 4000 units. Any fixed cost will be the same both time, but both levels. And so the variable cost is 3840 for 4000 extra units, which is. Uh, 96 per unit, 96 cents. Now it's very tempting to carry on and calculate the fixed cost, but in fact there's no need, and remember you are under time pressure, you don't want to have to waste time. The reason being, they want to know <coughs> what the total cost will be if it's 85% capacity, for the capacity of 10,000 units, that's 8,500 units. Well, we already know what the total cost is for 6,000 units. For 6,000 units, the cost is 11,280. Why should the cost be any higher if we make 8,500 units? Well, any fixed cost will stay unchanged. The only extra cost will be the extra variable cost of the extra 2,500 units. The difference. And well, how much will it, uh, what will the extra variable cost be of 2,500 extra units? Well, at 96 cents a unit. It's an extra 2,400. And therefore, the total cost will be uh, oh, 13,680, is that correct? A. All right, uh, number 18. Using an interest rate of 10% per year, the net present value of a project has been correctly calculated at $50. If the interest rate is increased by 1%, of the, uh, by 1%, the MPV falls by $20. What is the internal rate of return of the project? Well, there's always there's several ways of getting it, but this is quite clever because a lot of people just purely learn a formula. If you've just learnt a formula, I'm not saying you can't get it right, but it does make it all a bit confusing. If you've watched uh, my lectures, you'll know that I never use a formula. I think it's important to understand, and if you understand what's happening, you can almost write the answer straight down. At 10%, the net present value was 50. The internal rate of return, remember, is when the net present value is zero, and with higher rates of interest, a lower NPV. So we know that the internal rate of return must be more than 10%. It must be more. The NPV will be lower. Uh, we want it to be lower, we want it to be zero. The question is, how much more? Well, at 10%, uh, the MPV was 50. So we need the MPV to reduce by 50. We know that it'll reduce by 20 for every 1%. So if it's 1% higher, the MPV will go down by 20 to 30. If it's 2% higher, the MPV will go down by 40, down to 10, and so on. 
Well, we want the MPV to grow by 50. It's two and a half times 20. For every 20, it would fall by 1%. So it's 10% plus 50 times 1% over 20. The IRR is 12.5% therefore, which is answer C. Uh, that was 18. Number 19. After the reapportionment of service cost centre costs has been carried out, what is the total overhead for production cost centre P? A very standard sort of question. Just reading that should have made you guess what's going to be happening. If you look back, we've got two production cost centres, P and Q, and two service cost centres, X and Y. So there are four cost centres in this business. The total allocated and apportioned overhead switch is as follows. So $95,000 in P, $82,000 in Q, $46,000 in X, $30,000 in Y. However, X and Y are service centres, and so their costs have to be reapportioned to P and Q, the production centres. And we're told there how they do work for the other two. Percentage of service cost centre X to P and Q, 50% to P, 50% to Q. Uh, percentage of service cost centre Y to P and Q. Uh, to PQ and X, 30%, 60%, 10%. Well, we need to reapportion. I'll reapportion Y first. I'll tell you why after. But in fact, apart from the time, it wouldn't matter. But what I mean by that, the 30,000 uh, Y, we're going to take that 30,000. And how do they do the work? 30% is for P. So 30% of 30,000, 9,000 is given to charge to P, 60% to Q, of 30,000, 18,000 therefore is charged to Q, 10% of 30, so 3,000 is charged to X. We've now finished with Y. Service centre X now has costs of 49,000. That needs recharging. And how do they work? X works 50% for each of P and Q. So 50% of 49 is 24,500 to P, 24,500 to Q. Sorry, that was taking the 49. So we now finish with X. What does the question want? The total overhead for P. So the total to P, we already have 95,000. Another 9, another 24,500. I get 128,500. The answer is D. Two things. Remember, from the very beginning, it's only P they wanted. So for heaven's sake, However quick it is, don't waste time adding up Q. It only take a few seconds, uh, but those seconds matter. Uh, secondly, which you do first of X and Y. Um, the reason I did Y first, or put it the other way, the reason I did X last is I could see straight from the question that X only worked for P and Q. Whereas Y works for X as well. So if one the service centre works for the other, do that one first. Do Y first, and we've got rid of Y. Then come to the other. Well, X only does work for P and Q. Now, if you'd done it the other way around, it wouldn't actually matter. I'm not going to redo it here. But if you had reapportioned X first, that 46 would have disappeared and gone to P and Q. 
you'd then be reapportioning y and some more appears for x. So then you'd need to apportion that x as well. So it'd take slightly longer, but you'd end up with exactly the same answer. I'm sorry, I said in, in the exam, don't be neat with your workings because nobody will look at them. Um, I didn't mean to make it that messy, but still. Anyway, number 20. A company always determines its order quantity for raw material by using the economic order quantity, the EOQ model. What would be the effects on the EOQ and the total handling, oh, no, no, the total annual holding cost of a decrease in the cost of ordering a batch of raw materials? Now, I know a lot of people hate this. And it's quite common to have a variation on this one. Uh, most EOQ questions are putting numbers in to a formula. And most people can cope with that well, but it's when, it's this, what's the effect of this going up or down? I'm afraid it's just practice. All I can do is this. If you look at the formula sheet, the economic order quantity is the square root of 2 times D times CO over CH. Uh, what did I saw here? What's the effect of a decrease in the cost of ordering a batch? The cost of ordering is CO. It's saying what happens if that goes down? Well, I appreciate it's less obvious without numbers. You should be happy from school. But if the top bit all right, numerator, but the top bit, if, if the top bit is lower, you know, maybe it was $10 and it's gone down to $8. If the top of the um, equation is lower, then the whole answer is lower. The EOQ will be lower. It, well, yes, lower, it decreases. So we already know the answer is C or D. But what else is what? The annual holding cost. Well, again, if you've been through the lectures, you know, you thought about it as opposed to just learning rules and nothing else. Um, the, aver um, the holding cost depends on the average level of inventory. The average inventory is always equal to the order quantity over 2. So, if the EOQ is lower, if the order quantity is lower, the average inventory is lower. And if your average level of inventory is lower, then the cost of holding it will be lower. The annual holding cost is lower. Again, it's taken me a while, but it's because I'm writing. It shouldn't take that long. But now we've got it. The EOQ will be lower. The annual holding cost will be lower. The answer is D.